Over the last couple of years, uh, FICO has been doing um, a couple of consumer um, studies. And so we've been going out to US consumers and asking them a lot about um, the different kinds of financial services they're using, um, a little bit of how they want to be using sort of different kinds of products, et cetera. And this last wave, uh, we decided to include some information about auto purchases. And we got some interesting uh, results. And one of the first questions we had was around sort of, you know, there's all these, you know, car on demand services, et cetera. Um, how is that really impacting um, sort of the overall buying um, of different segments within the market? And so we had this sort of Uber or own question, which was one of the ones that we were thinking about. And so when we got those results, what we saw is that we broke it out um, sort of overall, so over on the, on the side over here. Whoop. On this side over here, this is the entire wave, and then we have these different age groups over here. So we, we sort of took the millennials into two buckets. Um, and this is a little something we were talking about last night, is that sort of this 18 to 24 versus the 25 to 34. But what we saw is that these tall bars are the folks that their primary access to a car um, is actually that they own their own car. Um, and with this younger millennial group, what we saw sort of, this is the sort of use the car service. So this is the Uber, the Lyft, et cetera. And we see this as really low, both here um, across in the uh, 25 to 34, but kind of across the board. So if you're looking at sort of a substitute there, um, we did not see that rise up to be a dramatic number. But one of the things that we did find that was pretty interesting was that 13% of these younger millennials were not actually driving a car at all. And so we were interested to dig a little bit more into that. So within our own data, this is what we saw about those specific folks that were not driving. And so when you break it down sort of in the income, what we see here is many of them sort of in the under 50K, um, so a much higher number of them here than those that are driving kind of overall. Um, we also looked at employment status. So those that were um, not employed um, versus those that are from driving, many of those were students as well. And so this is sort of what we saw within our own data. But we also wanted to look and see a little bit what was outside of that. And so we looked at um, some data from the US Census um, that showed sort of the number of households and the number of vehicles in those different households. And what we saw is that there's this fairly constant um, of about 10,000 households in the US that do not have vehicles. And that's been relatively constant since the 1960s, um, which we thought was pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, the next piece that we then looked at was, you know, of that group sort of over that time, did our data correlate with other things within the industry? And what we saw is this is from the Federal Highway Association um, Administration. Um, and again, economics are really that big factor as to why those households do not have vehicles. And then we look at a little bit further in terms of that millennial population. And this is a little bit of some of the same data that I think we saw on day one um, with the Ally presentation, um, in that the JD Power number is showing that in 2010, millennials represented about 18% of new car purchases, and that's jumped up to 27%. So then we overlaid um, a little bit looking at the millennial job growth. So what is the job growth that's been going on um, you know, in these last number of years. And so when you look at that, those job growth numbers, you see this very clear picture of as the economics are getting better, um, obviously that's improving. And these are folks that are interested in buying cars. And so that gets us to our next piece here, which is we asked them about their likelihood to be buying a car in the next 12 months. And so we asked about new car purchases, new car lease, um, pre-owned car purchases, et cetera. And what you see over here is this 25 to 34 um, you know, 39% looking to get very likely to be purchasing a new car in the next 24, um, 12 months. We've got over here at 24% looking to um, buy a used or pre-owned car. So these numbers for the sort of older millennial population, much higher than the overall population um, here at sort of 24% and at 16. Um, even with the younger millennial population, still relatively, um, you know, Good numbers here, a little bit higher um, down sort of in the um, used um, area than we see um, for the new. Um, we also see for the gener X, Generation X population looking to buy sort of that new car as well. We then looked a little bit at how they were interested in buying cars. And so we were trying to understand sort of some of the newer channels, et cetera. The part that was most interesting, dealership still number one across sort of all of the different groups that we looked at. Um, that was the place that folks were still very interested in going to actually purchase that vehicle. 
Um, what we do see, though, is that some sort of particularly in this older millennial population, um, a higher interest um, in going to some of the online. So this is sort of the auto trader pieces um, and or kind of the from another consumer with a Craigslist um, or eBay um, kind of piece there. Um, this number of the younger millennial population sort of going to the dealer, that was one that we were interested in is much lower, um, even though it is the highest, was much lower um, than we saw across the other groups. The next piece here, we looked at sort of how they wanted to pay for the vehicle. And so over here on this side, um, these bars represent the different age groups. Um, so we have sort of the, you know, the 18 to 24, how many of them are looking to pay entirely in cash for the vehicle. Um, and so it's what each one of these represents. Um, then the financing through a bank or a credit union, um, the dealer financing or on a credit card. And this was one that we were really interested in trying to tease out a little bit more, particularly with the credit card, in that we thought that potentially we were going to have much higher income folks um, who were interested in getting points or some sort of you know, potential rebid on a car, or that sort of thing. But what we actually found, um, so we asked them a couple of questions that got them into different delinquency groups. Um, so we didn't actually ask them or were we, we were not able to correlate a specific FICO score, but we asked them about um, particular kinds of activities that may have occurred to them over the last 24 months. So did they have a bankruptcy? Did they have a car repossession? Um, you know, were they late on payments? Or did they get sort of granted new credit, et cetera? So we then bucketed them into these three areas of high delinquency risk, um, moderate delinquency risk, and low delinquency risk. And in that um, sort of bucket down here, what we see is the high delinquency folks were the ones that were probably going to be using a credit card to try and purchase that vehicle. Um, we also see um, sort of that high delinquency also up here, um, one of the highest numbers um, of those um, that are be paying entirely in cash. So their access to credit is much more limited. Um, what we did find interesting is for the low delinquency group, those who probably had the most amount of cash on hand perhaps to be purchasing, um, they were choosing to take advantage of the low interest rates um, and financing those vehicles at a higher rate um, than we saw for some of the other groups as well. Um, so there were some interesting sort of insights that we saw in there. The last thing that I want to cover off on um, is around sort of some of these communication preferences. And what we saw, um, we were asking about sort of if you were to get a notification um, specific to a sort of under 90 day delinquency notice on this payment or an over um, 90 day kind of delinquency notice, what was your preferred channel of communication? And email was the, the primary one um, across all groups. So even when we looked at some of those younger millennials, so sort of the 18 to 24, um, sort of text and email were very close, but email was still a little bit higher than that. But what this really gets to um, is something that I think Mike Magard talked a little bit about um, yesterday, is making sure that you've got some sort of automated system in place to be able to take advantage of multiple different kinds of communication channels, to be able to use analytics behind the way that you're going to be sending out those kinds of communications, et cetera. And one of the other sort of last pieces um, that I'll leave you with on this communications component is that oftentimes sort of you want to get that phone call out. Most people, um, you know, depending on if you've got access to the mobile phone or not, um, sort of a combination piece here. Most people are not going to be answering a number that they do not know. And so if you're able to send them a text message ahead of time to say, hey, we have an important um, sort of contact that we need to make with you about something, we're going to be calling you soon, that can then sort of soften up for the call to come through afterwards. And so that was sort of this one-two punch with some of orchestrating between all of these different channels um, was one thing that was pretty key. So, with that, um, I'll see if there are sort of any questions. We'll be providing, obviously, all of this um, data to you. Um, we have some other um, reports um, that will also be coming um, that'll cover a broader range um, of sort of the consumer views that we've been gathering um, over the last couple of years.